All right, well, uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, today we finish up reading the book of 2 Corinthians. And uh, so if you would, grab your Bibles and open up, and uh, we will be reading chapters 10 through 13. In the uh, last few chapters of 2 Corinthians, uh, Paul uh, really gives us some really good tools to, uh, to understand the battle that we're in. Uh, the battle that we're in with Satan, and, um, and just really brings um, you know to fruition the final uh, few chapters um, in his concerns for the uh, the Christians in Corinth. So let's go ahead and jump into chapter ten, and we'll give a little bit of commentary as we go. It says, so, "By the humility and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you, I Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold toward you when away." I beg you that when I come, I might not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine powers to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. So it's interesting here, uh, you know, Paul says, you know, when the, the weapons that we, that we fight with, and not just him, but us as Christians, they are not weapons of this world. You know, we live in the world, but we don't wage war in the same way that the world does. The world wages war with, with bullets. The world wages war with, um, with slanderous things. Um, but we, we wage war not with weapons that are carnal or of this world, but we, we-, we wage weapons um, that are not of this world. He says, on the contrary, the weapons that we have have divine power. We have the Spirit of God, the power of God that we call upon, the power of God. Um, we call upon God himself as we go into battle and we fight things. We have divine powers. And not only that, when we call upon God, we're, we're, we're battling against spiritual powers of principalities of darkness. And, and so the divine powers are here to demolish the strongholds that the enemy has. And so we are speaking life uh, to demolish any strongholds that the devil would bring into our lives and over our families, over our communities, and over our world. And so we take every thought that's out there, and we take it captive, and we make it obedient to Christ. So that's why we our worldview and how we view Christ, how we view the world, is extremely important in making sure that we have a biblical worldview and a full understanding of the Word of God and what God says about this world, what God says about sin and about righteousness and all of those things. So extremely important. And uh, verse 7, you are judging by appearances. If anyone is confident that they belong to Christ, they should consider again that we belong to Christ just as much as they do. So even if I boast somewhat freely about the authority the Lord gave us for building you up rather than tearing you down, I'm not ashamed of it. I do not want to seem to be trying to frighten you with my letters. For some say his letters are weighty and forceful, but in person he is so unimpressive and his speaking amounts to nothing. Such people should realize that what we are in our letters when, we're, when we are absent, we will be in our actions when we are present. We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. We, however, will not boast about beyond proper limits, but will confine our boasting to the sphere of service God himself has assigned to us, a sphere that also includes you. We're not going too far in our boasting, as would be the case if we had not come to you, for we did get as far as you with the gospel of Christ. Neither do we go beyond our limits by boasting of work done by others. Our hope is that as your faith continues to grow, 
our sphere of activity among you will be will greatly expand so that we can preach the gospel in the regions beyond you for we do not want to boast about work already done in someone else's territory but let the one who boasts boast in the lord for it is not the one who commends himself who is approved but the one whom the lord commends and so paul there is saying you know we need to leave all of this up to the lord and it's kind of like with with uh, you know myself and my family my wife we were church planters and as we go and we plant a church and then we leave it up to god to you know, basically you know the 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 proof is in the fruit of the work that we do and in the end we don't we don't boast about the work that we have done in the past the ministries that we've had and, and he's basically saying you know our the, the in the end it's all about the fruit that's taken place in people's hearts and in their lives and we're not here to try to compare ourselves with what other people have done what they haven't done and ultimately in the end the goal is is that the work of god the kingdom of god will continue to expand beyond the places even where we have already planted and already done ministry and that's what paul here is saying he's saying you know we're not going to measure ourselves according to other people and in the end the lord is going to be the one who knows the the truth about our ministry the truth about the fruitfulness of it and so we need to just understand that it is god who is the one who commends people for the work that they do you know and and so he's trying to bring people to a point of understand tell, helping them understand this isn't about paul and his kingdom it's about god and his kingdom it's not about wayne otto and my kingdom and what i'm building the churches i planted it's about god it's about his kingdom and uh in about what the lord wants to do in people's hearts and in their lives and uh, we we need to always make sure that we measure ourselves very carefully we're not trying to compare ourselves with other people or even lift ourselves up and elevate ourselves we don't need to we don't need to have a need for that in our lives uh, look at chapter 11 he says i hope you will put up with me in a little foolishness yes please put up with me i am jealous for you with a godly jealousy i promised you to one husband to christ so that i might present you as a pure virgin to him but i'm afraid that just as eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to christ for if someone comes in to you and preaches a jesus other than the jesus we preached or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received or a different gospel from the one you accepted you put up with it easily enough i do not I do not think I am in the least inferior to those super apostles. I may indeed be untrained as a speaker, but I do have knowledge. We have made this perfectly clear, clear to you in every way. Was it a sin for me to lower myself in order to elevate you by preaching the gospel of God to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by receiving support from them so as to serve you. And when I was with you and needed something, I was not a burden to anyone for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied what I needed. I have kept myself from being a burden to you in any way and will continue to do so. As surely as the truth of Christ is in me, nobody in the regions of Achaia will stop this boasting of mine. Why? Because I do not love God? God knows I do. And I will keep on doing what I am doing in order to cut the ground for the cut the ground from under those who want an opportunity to be considered equal with us in the things they boast about for such people are false apostles deceitful workers masquerading as apostles of christ and no wonder for satan himself masquerades as an angel of light It is not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness, their end will be what their actions deserve. I repeat, let no one take me for a fool, but if you do, then tolerate me just as you would a fool so that I may do a little boasting in this self-confident boasting. I'm not talking as the Lord would, but as a fool, since many are boasting in the way the world does i too will boast you gladly put up with fools since you are so wise 
In fact, you even put up with anyone who enslaves you or exploits you or takes advantage of you or puts on errors or slaps you in the face. To my shame, I admit that we were too weak for that. Whatever, whatever anyone else dares to boast about, I'm speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast about. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked hard, much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open water, in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in dangers from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cut cold and naked besides everything else. I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak, and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin, and I do not inwardly burn? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show show my weaknesses. The God and the Father of our Lord Jesus, who is to be praised forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor, under King Artis, had the city of Damascus guarded in order to arrest me. But I was lowered in a basket from a window in the wall and slipped through his hands. I must go on boasting, although there is nothing to be gained. I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool, because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say, or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, and hardships, and persecutions, and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong." I have made a fool of myself, but you drove me to it. I ought to have been commended by you, for I am not in the least inferior to the super apostles, even though I am nothing. I persevered in demonstrating among you the marks of a true apostle, including signs, wonders, and miracles. How were you inferior to the other churches, except that I was never a burden to you? Forgive me this wrong. Now I am ready to visit you for the third time, and I will not be a burden to you, because what I want is not your possessions, but you. After all, children children should not have to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. So I will very gladly spend for you everything I have and expend myself as well. If I love you more, will you love me less? Be that as it may. I have not been a burden to you, yet crafty fellow that I am, I caught you by trickery. Did I exploit you through any of the men I sent to you? I urged Titus to go to you, and I sent your brother our brother with him. Titus did not exploit you, did he? Did we not walk in the same footsteps by the same spirit? Have you been thinking all along that we have been defending ourselves to you? We have been speaking in the sight of God as those in Christ, and everything we do, dear friends, is for your strengthening. For I am afraid that when I come, I may not find you as I want you to be, and you may not find me as you want me to be. I fear that there may be discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. I'm afraid that when I come again, my God will humble me before you, and I will be grieved over many 
who have sinned earlier and have not repented of the impurity, sexual sin, and debauchery in which they have indulged. This will be my third visit to you. Every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I already give, gave you a warning when I was with you the second time. I now repeat it while absent. On my return, I will not spare those who sinned earlier or any of the others, since you are demanding proof that Christ is speaking through me. He is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. For to be sure, he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by God's power. Likewise, we are weak in him, yet by God's power we will live with him in our dealing with you. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you, unless, of course, you fail the test? And I trust that you will discover that we have not, not failed the test. Now we pray to God that you will not do anything wrong, not so that people will see that we have stood the test, but so that you will do what is right, even though we may seem to have failed. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. We are glad whenever we are weak, but you are strong, and our prayer is that you may be fully restored. This is why I write these things when I am absent, that when I come I may not have to be harsh in my use of authority, the authority the Lord gave me for building you up, not for tearing you down. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All God's people here send their greetings. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Um, it's a beautiful benediction that he gives there. You know, may the grace of the Lord, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. That's a uh, it's a powerful benediction. So Paul, he's he's having to to bring um, some you know some correction again to the core, uh, Corinthian church. There are some who are these super apostles who are calling into question Paul's credentials. And Paul pretty much is, is just saying to them, listen, I've not, just because I have not boasted in your midst doesn't mean that, that I don't have the credentials. All of the credentials that these super apostles were trying to use, Paul is basically saying to them, he says, you know, you've kind of forced me into this. I've not, I've not pulled these things out to try to get you to, to, to treat me with dignity like some of them are trying to do. In other words, they were kind of pulling out their credentials and trying to trying to get them to, to you know, influence them. There are these people who are in power who try to sway people to follow them because it's all about getting followers of themselves, not really Jesus. And Paul says, listen, I'm not, I've not done that to you. I've not tried to exploit you. I've not tried to use my credentials to try to manipulate you. He says, the truth is the credentials of an apostle come with signs and power and uh, those things that you have, you, you have actually witnessed from me. And he says, you know, as for the earthly credentials, he says, I've got them, but I've never ever tried to use them. And he lists them and he says, you know, y'all have forced me to do this, you know, but so I'm speaking out of my mind here. This is not this, this is not even where the power rests in earthly credentials, but in God's credentials. Um, the fruit of the work, the Holy Spirit, the righteousness, the you know the and, and he says, you know, you, you are my spiritual children, and you're being swayed by these people, which can be very, very, uh, very disappointing. Quite honestly, as a pastor to see how quickly and easily people can be swayed and persuaded by people who have an earthly view rather than eternal view. And so that's what really kind of the last few chapters of, of second Corinthians really Paul brings us into light and um, you know, just reminds them of, of who they are in Christ, where they came from, you know, the fact that they came, you know, the very, the very life that they have spiritually came from the ministry that God gave to him. And uh, yet they were so quickly abandoning Paul as their spiritual father to run after something else and someone else. And, um, and he says, ultimately, you know, you're in God's hands. And so 
That's it's a pretty powerful, uh, you know, powerful chapter there at the end that uh, that Paul is uh, finishing up as he writes to the Church of Corinth. So congratulations, you finished up another book of the Bible, uh, really incredible, and uh, so I'm re really uh, really grateful that <clears throat> that you've read through this book with us. Uh, we begin starting up tomorrow the book of Ezra, so we'll jump back into the Old Testament. And uh, they're going to be, be uh, begin rebuilding now the, the walls around Jerusalem and eventually rebuilding, you know, Jerusalem and, and, uh, and you know, the temple for temple worship. So it's going to be really powerful. Now let's go ahead to Psalm 115. It says, not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory because of your love and faithfulness. Again, that, that first verse, how important, that's what Paul is saying. Saying, I'm not boasting about myself. It's not to us, not to me, but to your glory. When, when people want it to be about their glory, that's a dangerous thing. When you want to, if, if you want to make the ministry that you have about your glory, about what you've done, if I want to do that, about what I've done and for my glory, let me tell you, that's a dangerous place. He says, not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory because of your love and faithfulness. Why do the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in heaven. He does what he pleases, what pleases him. But their idols, their idols are silver and gold made by human hands. They have mouths, but cannot speak. Eyes, but cannot see. They have ears, but cannot hear. Noses, but cannot smell. They have hands, but cannot feel. Feet, but cannot walk nor can they utter a sound with their throats. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. All you Israelites trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. House of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. You who fear him, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. The Lord remembers us and will bless us. He will bless his people Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, small and great alike. May the Lord cause you to flourish, both you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth who is, he has given to mankind. It is not the dead who praise the Lord, those who go down to the place of silence. It is we who extol the Lord, both now and forevermore. Praise the Lord. All right, that's pretty awesome. I love that passage, verses 9, 10, 11. It says, all you Israelites, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. House of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. You who fear him, trust in the Lord. He is your help and your shield. I hope you know that he, God, is your help and he is your shield. He's your help. What do you need help with? He will help you. He's your shield. How are you being attacked from the enemy, from people? He's your shield. I'm grateful for a God who he is my hope and he's my shield. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for being our help and our shield. Help us to rely on you. Help us to turn to you as our helper in times of trouble. Help us to, to hide behind you as our shield, God, when we are under attack. And Lord, we thank you. Uh, because it is your unfailing love that gets us through all of those things. So, Lord, we exalt you. We lift you up. Help us to not make it all about us, but unto, unto you, Lord. You deserve all the praise. You deserve the glory. Unto you, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, thank you again for reading with me. Congratulations on finishing up a new book in the Bible. And we will pick up with Ezra tomorrow. Hope you have a wonderful day. God bless you.